Dear Sangha, today is Sunday, January 5th, 2012. We are in the Thousand Stars Meditation Hall in the winter retreat. Our Plum Village has a gatha to practice breathing and walking. Let the Buddha breathe, let the Buddha walk. This is very good gatha. We know that breathing is an art and walking is an art. It's a way to breathe that can bring us a lot of peace and happiness. There's a way to walk that brings us happiness and peace in each step. So whoever comes to Plum Village needs to learn how to breathe, how to walk, how to sit. Sit in a way that you have peace and happiness. Breathe in a way that you have peace and happiness. Walk in a way that you have peace and happiness. And outside of that, you have other practices, such as eating, eating breakfast, so that you can have peace and happiness while you eat. Brush your teeth in a way that you have peace and happiness. Using the toilet in a way that you have peace and happiness. That's the practice. When you're able to do that, then you have peace, happiness. When you sit, walk, eat. So at that time, you can help others to do the same. In us, we have people who are able to do this. We have people that they have happiness while they sit. That they have happiness while they sit. Happiness while they walk. And of course, we believe that the Buddha he has happiness while he was breathing because that's our teacher. The Buddha has happiness while he was walking. The Buddha has happiness while he was sitting. So that's why we have some experiences. There are times that we sit and we have happiness. At times when we breathe, we have happiness. And we walk with happiness, and we know that the Buddha is the same. The way that the Buddha breathe, walk, it brings a lot of happiness to the Buddha. It's because we have been through these experiences, the times that we sat with happiness, breathe with happiness, and walk with happiness. So we know that the Buddha is hidden within us. The Buddha is inside, coming back to take refuge in the Buddha in inside. So we invite the Buddha inside to sit for us, 
to work for us, to, walk, to breathe for us. So if we know if the Buddha breathes, sit or walk, then the quality of the sit, walk and breathe is high. So when we sit, we invite the Buddha to sit with us and for us. When we walk, we invite the Buddha to walk for us and walk with us using our two legs. And if the Buddha is walking, the quality of the steps is very high. And we're able to benefit from that. So that's why we let the Buddha breathe, let the Buddha sit, let the Buddha walk. So we we'll go looking for the Buddha, not an outside entity, but the Buddha is right within us. In Buddhism, we learn that everyone has a Buddha nature. That everyone has Buddha nature. And if we know to treasure and interact with the Buddha nature, then that will become a source of energy. And we, when we use that energy to sit, walk, breathe, then it's very great. Because the Buddha sits with mindfulness and right concentration. The Buddha breathes with right concentration and mindfulness. And the Buddha walk with right mindfulness and right concentration. Each step has the ability to nourish. Each step has the ability to heal. Each step help us to stop. Are we not rushing, seeking about? And we know sometimes we're able to walk those kind of steps. We were able to take those steps. So believe that the Buddha is within us. And if we practice, we will be able to walk these steps in the present and in the future. When we invite the Buddha to breathe with us, walk with us, sit with us, then the quality of the sitting, the breathing, and the walking is high. So that's why we have happiness in our sitting, walking, and breathing. The Buddha is breathing. The Buddha is sitting. I get to breathe. I get to sit. I have happiness. So that's why the second gatha, it brings us a lot of happiness. We have the back, we invite the back, the, in the Buddha to sit using our back. And when the Buddha use our back to sit, then our back becomes very straight. And when the Buddha sits, the Buddha relax. So when we invite the Buddha to use our body to sit, then we feel that there's a relaxation. So that's why the second gatha, the Buddha is breathing, the Buddha is sitting. I get to sit, I get to breathe. It brings us a lot of happiness. We do not need to rush to the third gatha. Just practice the second gatha to have a lot of happiness. To the third gatha, we go into deep looking. The Buddha is the breathing. The Buddha is the sitting. I am the sitting. I am the breathing. I recognize the Buddha because of the quality of the breathing and the quality of the way I sit. Because only the Buddha is able to breathe like that. Only the Buddha is able to sit like that. So that's why the Buddha is a breathing, the Buddha is a sitting. 
If another person sit and breathe, then the quality of the sitting and breathing is not like that. The Buddha is a breathing. The Buddha is a sitting. Buddha is the breathing. The Buddha is a breathing. So the sitting has a very high quality. Yeah, because we look into this posture of sitting, we know that the Buddha is there. If another person, not the Buddha, is sitting, then the quality of the posture of sitting is not the same like that. When we look into the quality of the breathing, the breath is very light, very deep and calm. It's mindfulness and brings about relaxation and peace. And we look into the breath, we know that only the Buddha breathes like that. So the truth is that don't look for a Buddha outside outside of the sitting posture or outside of the breathing. It's in the breath that we see the Buddha. It's in the sitting that we see the Buddha. Don't look for a Buddha outside of the breathing and outside the sitting posture. This is very important. This is the insight. During Christmas, the the sister of New Hamlet uh, gave a present to the monastics in the upper Hamlet, a printer, a photocopier. Because they heard that the upper Hamlet doesn't have a photocopier. And the sister uh, said that when the brother used the photocopier, then the brother needs to use it correctly. And the sister wrote in the manual that there is the printing, but there is no printer. There is the printing, but there is no printer. Only is the printing happening, but there is no person printing. We can see this clearly. We press the button and we we stand there and we see that the machine prints by itself. It's only the printing happening. We don't see a person printing. So the sister in the new hamlet reminds the brothers in the printing there is the printing going on but there is no printer. So when we invite the Buddha to breathe and sit we don't think that there is a Buddha uh, outside of the breathing and the sitting. The Buddha is the breathing, the Buddha is the sitting. That breathing is the Buddha. That sitting is a Buddha. There's no Buddha outside. When we say it rains, when we say it rains, it rains. In English, it rains. When we write, it rains, we see the two words. We see rains and we see the rainer. There is the rain and there is the rainer in order to rain. In 
But the truth is, there is only the rain. There is no person making the rain. There is no separate object, entity, outside of the rain. When we say the wind blows, it's like there's a verb blows and there's a subject that blows. And we can imagine that the wind Sometimes it blows, and sometimes it doesn't blows. And we say the wind blows. We never say the wind does not blow. If it does not blow, then there's no wind. The wind is the blow. Outside of the blowing, there is no wind. So we just think that the wind is that, and behind the wind there's a person, a subject, that is blowing. The wind just blowing by itself. There's no blower behind it. The wind is the blower. So it's the same with our breath, breathing. We say the Buddha is breathing, the Buddha is the sitting. Do not look for the Buddha outside of the breathing or the sitting. So when we understand that the rain, there's only the rain and there's no rainer. There's only the blow, there's only the wind and there's no blower. Then we understand that there's no only sitting and there's only breathing. But there's no sitter there's no breather. It's only printing, but no printer. This is an insight that we need to attain. If we're not able to see that, we get stuck in this nghe. This is attachment to a subject. A self. The Buddha is a sitting, the Buddha is a breathing. I am the sitting, I am the breathing. And outside of that, looking for a separate self, there's no such thing. This is the most important and most foundational teaching in Buddhism. If we want to transform our suffering, then we have to see this. this Insight of non-self. When we look into ourselves, what do we see? We see our body. That's called the form. What else do we see? We see feelings. What else do we see? We see perceptions. What else? We see mental formations. And what else? We see the perceptions. And all these, they depend on each other and they flow like a river. They flow like a river. And outside, those five skandhas that making up the river, there is no subject independent entity that's outside of that. There is no self. For example, we say, the river is flowing. So what is the river? The river is all the water droplets that come together and they flow. 
Outside those water droplets that's flowing, there is no independent river standing outside. There are only the water droplets flowing. There is no separate river standing outside. So it's the same with us. We are a combination of the five skandhas that are flowing, a continuous flow. And in there, there is no subject that is permanent, that's non-changing. There is no self. But we we often have this uh, perception that there is something that is permanent, that's non-changing, that's laying underneath the five skandhas of forms feelings, perceptions, mental formations, consciousness that are changing constantly. And in there, there is something that's permanent, that's non-changing, and that's called the self, the soul. That is called ngheke. This is a creation of uh, the mind. It's called mental conceptions. It's a discrimination, vikampa. And all of our afflictions that we suffer is based on the idea that there is a self, a separate self. It's permanent and non-changing. We believe that there's a soul, there's a self, there's a self or a soul that exists independently, that's not part of the five skandhas. And when our body dissolves and all the feelings, perceptions are not there anymore, but that, that self is still there and it still continues under another form. That it goes to heaven or it goes to hell. And that is a wrong view. It's a wrong view that in Buddhism is called Thường Kinh. Thường Kinh. So that's eternalism. That there is a self, a soul, an I, an ego. This is permanent, this non-changing. And all the other things, like the body, feelings, perceptions, it can change and it can dissolve, destroy, but that sense of self is still there always. That would go to heaven or goes to hell. And that, that kind of perception is a wrong view. It's the view of permanence, the view of eternalism. There's another uh, view that's opposite. That when this view is when this body uh, 
uh, breaks down, that there's no feelings, no, no consciousness, no thoughts, no mental formation, there's nothing left, completely nothing else left. Once you die, it's all over. So that's called Duan Ging. It's another kind of wrong view. So that's called annihilation. So these two views, they are two polar opposites, two wrong views. And right view is something that go beyond these two uh, views. The truth is in the middle way. It's not something eternal or something annihilation. So in our perceptions, there is nothing that is born, there is nothing that dies. So that's why That's why there's only the continuation. For example, when the cloud is not a cloud anymore, then it's continue under the form of the rain or a brook. And it continue on. And, and its nature of the cloud is, is not permanent or is not annihilation. It's a continuous flow, the image of the river. In Buddhism, we start with um, deep looking on impermanence so that we can see that there is nothing that's unchanging. Everything is continuously changing very constantly in each, se in each moment, in each sapna. And because everything is impermanent, So everything can only exist within one moment, sapna. And the next moment, sapna, is not there anymore, but it lets something else take its place. There's a continuation. Example of fire. We think that the fire is something that extends um, in time. But the truth is, the fire only exists in one moment. And next, it becomes the basis for the arising of the next fire. So the fire we see that is the continuations of millions of fires. So our body is the same. Our body, we think that is always the same like that. But if we just look, we can see clearly when we were born, we were tiny. And when we're five, we are bigger and slowly our body is changing in each moment. Our body is impermanent. Looking in terms of time, our body is impermanent. We just look at our body when we were five and we compare now, it's very different. We say that we are one with that five years old baby. It's not correct because we're so different from that child. And if we say that child is already dead and I am completely new person, that's not correct either. So between the child and us, 
there is a relationship, there's continuation. In Sanskrit, it is samtati or praviha. Looking in terms of time, we are impermanent. We're looking in terms of time, we see that we are impermanent. We are always changing. The me of this time is not the me of the previous moment. It's impermanent. If looking in terms of space, that impermanence becomes no self. Because what is self? Self is a something that's permanent. That's always this it. It doesn't change. So when we look deeply at our body, we have five skandhas. When we do not see there's anything that is permanent, everything is changing. So we know it's no self. And if we think that there's a permanent self within us, that's a wrong view. But if we believe that that wrong view, that eternalism or the annihilation view, so the word tương tục or interbeing help us to escape from these two polar opposites of eternalism and annihilation. So that's why when we are sitting, we can look deeply at ourselves and we see that we are not ourselves. We are a continuation, a continuation of our mom, our dad. We are not completely our dad or our mom but we are the continuations of our mom and our dad. And we're also continuations of our ancestor gran and grandparents. And we are continuous flow. Our ancestor, relatives, parents, grandparents, They are being continued within us. We see that we are a continuous flow. And when we're able to see that we are a continuous flow, we can escape from the idea of self. And because of that, we are not disturbed by our sufferings and causing us pain. First of all, this complex, complex of equality, complex of better than others, complex of lesser than others. We live in the Sangha. We have happiness or not. It depends on whether we're able to see this or not. If we accept ourselves and see who we are, then we can accept other people and see who they are. And, but if we can't accept ourselves, then we can't accept others. There are people in us who can't accept themselves. And we have this um, calm, inferior complex. We are angry at ourselves. And when, when we can't accept ourselves, how can we accept others? And if we don't accept each other, 
when we live together, there's no happiness. So the happiness in the Sangha is based on the practice of acceptance. We have to begin like this. I accept myself like that. I am a flow, continuous flow, because my grandparents, ancestors like this, that's why I'm like this, and I accept it fully. In me, there are talents. In me, there are weaknesses. I accept the talents and weaknesses in me. We saying like that doesn't mean I am powerless. Because of my practice, I can develop those talents. Because of the practice, I can transform some of these, transform slowly these weaknesses. So those two things go together. On one side, accepting the inheritance left behind, accepting the continuous flow. On one side, there's a dream, an aspiration to make it better. So this acceptance and this dream, they go together. So when there's a person looking at us, and brace us or criticize us and if we have that insight then we won't suffer because in while we're looking at ourselves we can see the good points and the negative points for sure there are things the talents and weaknesses everyone has those and those talents and weaknesses are not just only belong to a self. It's all from the inheritance, the transmission, just like the river. The river is like that because all these smaller branches going into the rivers are like that. We have to accept all of that. And this acceptance brings us peace. We have to accept that we have these merits, talents, and the weaknesses. It's very important. When someone else criticizes, for example, you are so good. Then we have to know how to react in a way that's in accordance with the Dhamma. We can see you say what you say is partly right. Because in me, there are these positive aspects, but you also remember that there are weaknesses. But what you say, your praise, is only partly right. So that's why we can escape from that complex of superior, of better than others. If we don't have that insight and people keep praising us, then we think we are God. So when someone praise you, that inside we have to say, you are partly right. I have some po positive points like that, but you don't know. I also have other negative aspects. We don't say that, but we have to think that if someone praises us, we have to say, you are partly right because you haven't seen my negative aspects. So we can keep our humility and we do not stick our nose up and we corrupt ourselves. For example, someone come and criticize you, you are useless. You are someone with a lot of weaknesses. And the same, we can say, this person only is only partly right. I have some also good points and talents. And at that time, we can reply, 
with our words or our silence, but inside we need to have that sentence. That is only partly right. You are only partly right. This is our sixth mantra. This mantra we can say in words, but for sure, if we say in words, we have to say it in ourselves. When someone come and praise you, then you have to remember to say that mantra. You praise me too much, but you don't see all my weakness. You only see a part of the truth. And you can also tell that person that. So that's the truth. Because if you're able to accept yourself, you have peace. And when you're able to accept yourself, you have the ability to accept others. It's great. We don't require the other person. We accept that person as is, but we still have this wish that this person with their practice can develop the good things in them and can uh, lessen their weaknesses. But that wish is not a pressure or a criticism. Because we behave to ourselves like this, we realize that in us we have the good points and the negative points. We accept both the positive and the negative aspects, and we have peace. But there's no one preventing us from having a wish that with this practice we can increase the good points and we can lessen the negative points. And we have the wish for ourselves like this, and we can also have the same wish for others. So that's why before we criticize a younger sister, we have to remember this. We have to accept that person first. Instead of saying, you are useless, we have to say, you have many good things, but there are a few weaknesses that I would like you to practice so that those weaknesses can be less. If you say it like that, the other person will be happier because in the Sangha, there are some people who are very, very fragile, sensitive. very sensitive. So they're afraid of the shining light. When we accept ourselves, we accept the weaknesses within us and all of a sudden we have peace and when we look at someone else we can accept other people easily we look at someone else and accept them and in our eyes there's a light of acceptance and when we look someone like that they are happy but if we look with the eyes of scru scrutinizing or criticizing, then that person will suffer. So that's why each of us should have that light of acceptance in our eyes. Dear brother, dear sister, dear siblings, I accept you like that. I accept you as you are. And our eyes have to shine that light of acceptance. Even if that person has weaknesses, and we wish that person to be able to transform them, but we have to be able to see that that person has weaknesses, but also they have good points in there. There's no one who doesn't have any talents or any good points. So when we are criticized by someone, we have to base it on that insight to see that he is partly right, only partly right. He has not seen the other part of me. That person only sees a part of us and not all of us, but that's the truth. How can you see all of the other person? Even ourselves, we don't see it. How can we see the other person? So we live in a community. We have to have that humility. 
We have to see that we don't have a separate self. We are continuations of our ancestors. All the talents, all the merits that we have, we think is ours of a separate self. All of those of from our ancestors transmitting to us. We have to see that. We have to give gratitude that our ancestor transmit to us the seeds of talents and virtues. If we have a body that's healthy or beautiful, we don't get too prideful because that belongs to the ancestor, it's not ours. And if we have some weaknesses, and some bad habits, that is also from the ancestor. Do not get stuck in the self-concept and get mad at ourselves, why am I like this? So the important thing is to accept acceptance. We have to accept ourselves. Like I said, accepting ourselves means we're not powerless in that position, but we have to have aspiration for our practice to develop our positive points and with our practice we can decrease our weaknesses. And if we're able to act like that to ourselves, then we can begin to act like that to other people. We can see the other people with the eyes of acceptance. Dear brother, dear sister, I accept you as you are. You are my brother, you are my sister. And the other person will be happy. It doesn't mean that we don't have any dream or wish for that person. We have the wish for that person the same as we have the wish for ourselves to develop the good seeds within them and able to transform a few negative aspects within themselves. So this um, mantra that I suggested is you are partly true. You are partly true. You are partly right. And when they praise us, that is just partly right. And when they criticize us, this is only partly right. Because all of us, we have our weaknesses and our strengths. Do not let the praising or the blaming can cause us suffering. And when we praise, or we criticize others, we have to be careful too. We just say our wish, but do not criticize or praise others. We don't inflate the ego of the other person bigger, to get bigger, and we don't want to get our own ego get bigger. Uh, in summary, we say that we don't have a separate self. There is no separate self. No separate I. But there is only a continuous flow. An interbeing flow. It's a river. This is something we should always remember. We have to look at ourselves as if it's a river continuation of our ancestors, parents, grandparents, and we're not a separate self. We are the ancestor, the grandparents, 
appearance. Secondly, we have to accept all, all the positives and negative aspects in that into being flow. There is a river. It has many branches that comes into it. And sometimes we see there is a river flowing and one side is clear water, one side is muddy water. And we have to accept all of that because of all the branches going in. So and that's how the river would be. We accept all of that, the positives and the negative aspects in the river. And the third thing is to wish this is the wish or aspiration. What do we wish for? Wish, wishing for strengthening and transforming. Strengthening the good things in the interbeing flow and transform transform or purify all these elements of that are still negatives within those are the things we are doing for ourselves In terms of saving ourselves, practicing for ourselves, if we're able to do that, then our relationship between us and others will be good. Because when we see other people, we can also see them as they don't have a separate self. That they are also an interbeing flow. If they have those talents, it's due to their ancestors transmitting that to them. If they have weaknesses, negative seeds like that, it's also due to their ancestors transmitting that to them. We have to accept that person like that and do not request or ask of them. It depends on whether you have that uh, insight within you. And if you have that insight, your eyes will show the light of acceptance. Dear brother, I accept you as you are. Dear sister, I accept you as you are. And when we look at that with the, with the eye of understanding and compassion, because understanding is compassion, we're seeing someone with the eyes of, of acceptance their suffering will be relief. Because in us, there are people in our community, sometimes there are people who are a bit more sensitive, a look that's a bit too criti criticizing, and that person will be seeking and will be suffering a lot. Sometimes we don't criticize, but that person thinks that we are criticizing. It's as if a bird that's been hurt by an arrow and seeing that the, there's this bending branch and they think it's, a, it's an arrow about to shoot at them. So we have to be careful. There's a lot of suffering. So we have to be able to see with the eyes of acceptance, seeing with the eyes of compassion. And we can understand that our understanding leads to compassion. If we want to love someone and we don't understand, how can we love them? 
And the understanding is the insight. Seeing that this person is, there's no separate self, it's just a continuous flow. And they had received the positive and negative aspect from their ancestor. So we accept our older brothers and older sister and younger brothers like that. And we say that. A few days ago in the upper hamlet, and they had a meeting and allowed three aspirants to become novice. And yesterday, I took those three to go on work, working meditation with me to Sanghae. And when the community accepts like that, and we know there's understanding and compassion, and we can be comfortable, when we feel that we are accepted, we feel very happy. So we have to practice to see everyone in the Sangha, in our big family, with the eyes of acceptance. Dear brothers, dear sister, I accept you as you are. But that doesn't mean that we don't have any wishes for that person. If we wish, we can have say something like this. Dear, dear sister, you have these positive points that you should uphold and strengthen so that you can have more happiness and the Sangha can have more happiness. And you have a few uh, negative aspects that you can ask the Sangha or yourself to find ways to transform them slowly so you can have more happiness. And the Sangha also has happiness. If we're able to say and see with the eyes of acceptance like that, the other person won't suffer, and the quality of peace and happiness in the Sangha will be increased. Our eyes can say a lot of things. Sometimes we don't say something, but our eyes are saying it. So that's why we have to have this insight, so that our eyes can say this acceptance of the other person. Because we're a family, we live together, we have to accept each other in order to have happiness. And we can have a chance to bring happiness to others. So these three points are the things that you can reflect for yourself. If you're able to accept yourself, you will have peace and happiness. Once you're able to accept yourself, you can accept others. And the happiness in the community life will be a reality. With other people, we have to be able to see these three points. With our eyes, and we can prove that we have this insight. And also with our words, we can show that. So that's why from now, to from now on, if someone praise us, instead of s we s um, putting our nose up to the sky, but we just say, you just saying it, you're partly right, I also have weaknesses. And when the other person criticizes, we say, sister, what you say is only partly right, but I'm not totally all that. I also have good points too, that's the truth. So that's the mantra, the sixth mantra that we can practice with uh, silence and it can protect us, help us from not being hurt by the criticizing words. If someone criticizes and we recite this mantra inside us, you are partly right only. You're only partly right. And before we praise someone or criticize someone, we know that that person will say that mantra within themselves. So we have to be careful. That person will say, you are partly, only partly right. Now I see my friends and my students, I see with that eyes, I accept everything 
and I have dream for these people and I also have dreams for myself. We study the 38th stanza. Ơ khổ, kế ngã thọ. Khổ lạc, liệu chi khổ. Phân biệt thử, khởi kiến. Tùng bị sanh, sanh bị. When we suffer, recognize that we are suffering. Does I am suffering or I am happy? Kế chấp khởi các kiến. So one view gives rise to another view. In the suffering, people say, I am suffering or I am happy. Discriminating like that about suffering, it can give rise to these views. And this view can give rise to another view and give a rise to another view. We can fix it as one view give rise to another view and and that view comes back to give rise to this view. This view give rise to another view and that view come in turn gives rise to this view. Tùng bị sinh, it means from that thing it was born. It's based on the other thing to be born. And it itself also gives rise to the other thing. When we have this, this wrong view about self, then we, when we have a suffering or a happiness, it arises. And instead of saying there is a suffering, there is happiness, then we say, I'm happy or I'm suffering. That suffering is arising, it's manifesting. Then we just say that, that suffering is arising. Why do we say, I am suffering? If there's a happiness that's uh, arising, we say there's a happiness arising. Why do I say uh, I am happy? Because there's no I. What's uh, present is the suffering or the happiness. There's no I behind it. It's the same as the printer. There's a printing, but no printer behind it. There's the rain, but there's no rainer. So that's the difference. When there is a sadness, a joy, or an anger, a happiness, we say there is a joy, is a happiness, a anger. We don't say that I am sad, I am happy, or I am um, angry, because there's no I. Uh, 
And this discrimination is vikampa. This discrimination is thinking that these two things are opposite, the two polar opposites and outside each other. For example, the suffering and the joy, the I and the non-I, the left and the right, the above and below. If we look at this marker, we can see that there's a left side and there's a right side. And we think that the left and right are two uh, separate realities. That the, these two opposites, uh, that they exist outside of each other. But if we look deeply, we can see the right is based on the left to manifest. If there's no left, then there's no right. If there's no right, then there's no left. That's called from this give rise to this, and this give rise back to that. From this give rise to this, the left is based on the right to appear, but the right is also based on the left to appear. That is called interbeing. It's called being. The left cannot by itself uh, exist. Cannot be by itself. The, ca alone. the left cannot be by itself alone. Born from this, born from this, and gives birth, and gives birth to this. To this. So that's interbeing. Interbeing or co-being. Co it's very important. So, what is our practice here? This is not a theory, this is the practice. The practice is that when there's a suffering that's appearing, then we have to look at that suffering and say, that suffering arise because of all these conditions, that gathering, and it causes suffering to manifest. The nature of suffering is arising due to conditions, and the conditions that can cause suffering to arise. Uh, there is an idea of self. If there is no idea of a self, then the, the suffering, there's not enough conditions to arise. So that's why we say, I am suffering. This is a mistake. Just like in our exercise, there's only the breathing, only the sitting. There's no breather, there's no sitter. It's the same here. There's only the suffering, only the joy. There's no person that's uh, suffering or being joyful. We have to see it like that. And when the joy appears, we say that there's a joy arising. Joy arise because there are conditions that gathering together that uh, makes joy have the condition to arise. Don't say, I'm joyful. No, no need for an I. And those two things, this discrimination between the suffering and the I, seeing that the suffering and I are two separate things, this is the wrong view. And this wrong view can bring a lot of afflictions. So that's called discrimination, vikapa imagination, mental conceptions. And the truth is that all dhammas 
uh, based on each other to arise. One helps the other to arise and also helps the other thing to arise. So that means arising together. Sahajati. Into being. Sahabut. So, when we see this, we have this right view. When we see ourselves, when we see that uh, that we are not a, a, a non-changing permanent entity, but we are a continuous flow, an interbeing flow then we can escape the, from the idea of self. And when we see this flow, this interbeing flow, we can see the positives and the negative aspects. And we see that it's not our self, but it's the things that coming together uh, from the previous generations. So we can escape from that uh, complex feeling like, why am I like this? and we can accept ourselves. So at that time we feel uh, at ease. And once we're at ease like this, and we have this insight, then the person next to us, the person we're looking at also feel at ease. Because once we're able to accept ourselves, we can accept the other people. It's very interesting. Or if you see the other person, and you see the other person as a continuous flow, and they don't have a self, their weaknesses and their talents are also due to the transmissions of their generations, and we accept that. We can feel at ease, we're not mad, we're not angry, we're not blaming or requesting something. So these two are into being. One gives rise to the other, and the other gives rise to this in return. When God said, light, you should appear. And light said, I have to wait. In Buddhism, there's a word uh, waiting for each other. It's very interesting, mutual waiting. Mutual waiting. When God said, Light, you should appear. Light said, I have to wait. God said, Who are you waiting for? I have to wait for darkness so that we can appear at the same time. Because light and darkness are two things that go together. They appear at the same time. If there's no darkness, there's no light. If there's no light, there's no darkness. And God said, darkness is already there. Why are you waiting? Then light said, if darkness is there, then I, I'm already there. I don't need to appear. It's like left and right. He said, right, you should appear. Said, I have to wait for the left. If the left is already there, then I am already there. Do you understand? <laughs> and all of these pairs, birth, death, exist, no existing, being, no being, inside, outside, object, subject are the same. Always the two appears at the same time. You cannot say this one thing appears before and one thing appears after. If there's above, then there's already below. If there's left, there's right already. If there's no left, then there's no right. That means mutual waiting. It's the symmetry in Buddhism, super symmetry. We're looking at uh, th the 39th stanza. 
Ý ô nhiễm thường sinh về diệt cùng các hoạt giải thoát phiền não ấy không trước cũng không sau. This word ý, it means manas. It means uh, based on the mind. Manas. And based on the mind, we have mind consciousness. Mind consciousness, mind consciousness, mental consciousness, mental consciousness, mental consciousness is it sometimes operates, sometimes it stops operating. But manas always operates. So the mind is has this tainted quality, defile, because the mind manas is a wrong view, is a a grasping, a tendency to grasp is a wrong perception, thinking that there is a permanent self, that separate self. Instead of saying there is suffering happening, saying that I am suffering. If there is a happiness happening, saying that I am happy, but don't say that there is happiness happiness or there's joy happening. Manas, it has this tendency to seek pleasures. Manas has this tendency to run away from suffering. The manas does not have wisdom. It cannot see that all the dangers why seeking for pleasure. Manas does not have that insight that suffering has this role of education. So they're afraid of suffering and does not know how to learn from suffering. And Manas does not know this rule of um, moderate consumption. So that's why the Manas is defilement. And Manas is always there. That is called tư lương. Tư lương. Tư lương. Tư lương. Ý, cái, cái, Manus. Cái bản chất. The nature function of manas is tư lượng, which means to plan, calculate, and to measure. Calculate so that it can have pleasure. Calculate so that it can avoid suffering. But it, but there is, there is no ability to see that in the pleasures, there are dangers, and cannot see that in the suffering that we can learn very valuable lessons. So that is calculating and planning. And you can call it mentation in English. You can also translate as cogitation. So that's manas. And that is hang. So this mental consciousness, sometimes is not there. It does not manifest. For example, when you sleep, and you, you sleep so well that you don't have a dream, then there's no mind consciousness. 
or when you're in a coma and unconscious and you don't have mind consciousness or when you go into a non-perception concentration state then mind consciousness stops working but this mind mind based madness is always there day and night grasping onto the self and that's why sufferings are not just sufferings they born and die with that madness Because there is ngã chấp holding on to yourself and a defile madness that's uh, always there. That's why the suffering are born and die and get continue and follow that madness together. Together, it's going together. Uh, this stanza is difficult. You giải thoát chưa hoặc phi tiên diệt phi hậu. If you want to truly uh, be liberated from the sufferings, the afflictions, those uh, afflictions like greed, angry, pride, sadness, envy fear, hopelessness. If you want all that to end, we have to see that this uh, concept of no before and no after. Let's try to read the paragraph version. During the time that defile madness, still exist, afflictions have conditions to arise and pass away. Liberation happens not before or after of the extinctions of those afflictions. This sentence, no before, no after, you can only understand if you read the 40th stanza. It's not that due to the other phenomenon were born, that the purification phenomenon is born. It's not that that was born, then the purification is born. It means that this pair of affliction and awakening would Awakening means purification, the, the absence of affliction, they're different. One side is affliction, one is liberation, so those two. So this stanza means that it's not that affliction happens before, and because of our practice, and we have liberation from affliction, and then we have awakening. Affliction is like darkness, and awakening is like the light. And according to the interbeing laws, if there is darkness, then, then light is only there. If there's the left, then the right is only there. It's not that the left happens before and then the right happens. 
after. It's not that you have affliction first and then you have awakening. Awakening and suffering happens at the same time. Do not think that affliction happens before and then awakening happens after. Don't understand liberation in that way. So in Mahayana Buddhism, we say that affliction is awakening. Nirvana and samsara. There is this pair of nirvana and samsara. Sintu is samsara. And nikbang is the end. Nirvana is the end of samsara. Everyone hears about the point of the practice is to go escape the cycle of samsara and go toward nirvana. Is that true? Everyone hears that, right? But according to this stanza, it's not that samsara happens before and because of our practice and the nirvana will happen later on. It's not like that. Because according to the truth, if there is samsara, at the same time you have nirvana. Nirvana and samsara are two sides of the same reality. It's like left and right, before and after, above and below. So that's why we say, God said, light, you should appear. And light said, I have to wait. God said, why are you waiting? I'm waiting for darkness to happen at the same time. But darkness is already there, then I am already there. I don't need to appear. So that's interbeing. So that's why Samsara and Nirvana are two sides of the same reality. If our perception is wrong view, then that is Samsara. And if our perception is right view, then that is Nirvana. If that is wrong view, then we see that it's a suffering. If we have right view, then that is It's called Tương Đại. In Buddhism literature, we often hear that Nirvana and Samsara are flowers. Spo Nirvana and Samsara are flowers in empty space. And we see that, we brush our eyes and we see the flowers in space, those two things. Don't think that they are two separate realities. The two things are two sides of the same reality. It's like we said, historical dimension and ultimate dimension. It's like we say essence and phenomena. Or when we say water and wave. Water and wave are two sides of the same reality. If there's no wave, there's no water. If there's no water, there's no wave. It's not that the wave happened before and the water happens after, or the water happens before and the waves happen after. For example, when we see a cloud, in the beginning we see the cloud has birth and death. It's because we see in terms of phenomena. From the view of phenomena, we see that the cloud has exists and non exist birth and death. And when we see that there's birth and death, being and non-being, then we don't feel very secure, we feel fear and there's some regret. But if we look at the cloud deeply, then we see that the cloud has no 
birth and death, no being, no non-being. The cloud has never been born and never dies. The cloud is not from nothing into something, and the cloud is not from something into nothing. And we can see the no birth, no death quality of the cloud. So we look at the cloud, we can see the word has birth and death. And we look at the cloud, we can also see the word that has no birth and no death. So samsara and nirvana is the same. It's the same thing, but depends on how we view it. The view that is uh, doesn't have mindfulness, then we can only see birth and death and afflictions. But if a different view, a right view, we see that there's no birth, no death, that means we see nirvana. So this is awakening and affliction are the same thing. It's because we get stuck in the idea, the view of self, because we have this defile manners. So that's why we see that there is affliction, the word is suffering. But when we escape from that view, then all of a sudden it's the same thing, but we see awakening. So that's why this says there is, th it's not that affliction happens before and the awakening happens after. If there's affliction, then there is liberation. And those two things are two illusions, two concepts. And when we awaken, then affliction is awakening, samsara is nirvana. And we do not run away from samsara, and we do not seek for nirvana. And because we see that nirvana is right there in samsara. There's a Vietnamese Zen master. His student asked, where do I find the non-birth, non-death in? Because when we take refuge in the no birth, no death, we feel good, there's no uh, fear. And the teacher said, you find the no birth, no death, right in the birth and death. You find nirvana right in samsara. You, you find awakening right in suffering. If you run away from your suffering, then you never find awakening. If you run away from your afflictions, then you will never find peace and happiness. So that's what is called no before and no after. It's not that the suffering happens before and then the purification and uh, happens after. Because if there is no defilement, how can you have the liberation? Liberation, liberation from what? If the untainted is tainted, to get rid of the tainted, then the untainted occurs. If there is no untainted, how can you get rid of the taint? So that's why the untainted does not happen after. It happens at the same time as the tainted, because we don't see that. If we take away the tainted, then the untainted uh, happens. If we take away the samsara, the nirvanas will happen. And to take away is a way of saying we look deeply into samsara and we see nirvana. If we see look deeply into affliction, we can see the liberation. That is that is the non-duality quality. That is the 40th stanza. It's not that due to the other phenomenon happens that this purification happens. It means it's not that before you have affliction and then the purification will happen after. It's not like that.
If the non-defilement is not there, then how come you say there's liberation? Liberation from what? The untainted is there, but is but it get tainted. So now it can become untainted again. It's not that the untainted happens after. There's one more stanza, the 40th stanza. All that have been tainted, their true nature is pure. So it means if there is no object of purification, then there is no subject of purification. What has been tainted, their true nature is purification. If there is no object of purification, then there is no subject of purification. For example, in the Gatha of, of a teacher Tandu, uh, it says that Thân thị Bồ Đề Thọ Tâm như minh kính đại Thời thời thường phức thức it means that our body is the Bodhi tree and our mind is the bright mirror. So we have to usually clean the dust. Do not let the dust attach. So Minh Cảnh Đài is a bright mirror. That bright mirror, you need to have that. So you have a place that dust can come and attach. So that dust is affliction and the bright mirror is awakening. And if you say that the dust happens before and the mirror happens after, it's not correct. You need to have the bright mirror at the same time as the dust. So when you wash, the bright mirror appears. If you say affliction happens before you practice for a while and then you have liberation, then that's not correct. That liberation is already there before. So that's why looking deeply, what we call defilement before, it was pure. Because if you don't have the object to clean, then how can you have a washing to make it clean? If there's no mirror, no bright mirror, how can you have the washing to have the light? So don't say that before that there is no awakening, that before only affliction. Awakening is only there. We only take away the wrong view and all of a sudden awakening brightens up. It's not something that happens after. We have three more stanzas. Next week we will study and after that we study Wang Se Yin Yin Lang.